to civilians, uh, 10 to 1. In World War II, about 50-50, 50% 50, 50, 50 civilians, 50% military. In Vietnam, 70% of those millions who died were civilians. Now it's more like 80 and 90% civilians, men, women, and children. War is inevitably a war against children, and therefore it cannot be accepted. Uh, and therefore we must, even if it's a long-term, long, long-term goal, we must think about its abolition. Just as people in the 1830s in this country, although the end of slavery was far off, they began to think about the abolition of slavery. So, uh, uh, what shall we do? <laughs> Uh, uh, well, I think we, we uh, learning from history, being honest about uh, the past and about what's going on today, we have to come to the conclusion that we cannot depend on, on the government for justice, we cannot depend on the press for justice, we cannot depend on the opposition party, because there is no not much of an opposition party. Uh, uh, and, you know, whatever... Uh, th there are some possibilities for opposition in that party. If, if the Democrats win uh, the House, John Conyers will be head of the Judiciary Committee, and he has been a leading force for impeachment, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> but in general, no, we can't depend... We have to depend on ourselves. And historically, this is what you see. When any serious injustice had to be remedied, it was not initiated by the government or the president or Congress or the Supreme Court. It was done by the people themselves organizing, uh, protesting, uh, sacrificing, risking. Uh, the labor movement did not win the eight-hour day because Congress passed a law or the president an edict or the Supreme Court. The labor working people won the eight-hour day because they did it themselves. There was nothing in the Constitution there's no Economic Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Uh, although Roosevelt in 1944 asked for an Economic Bill of Rights, no bill, Economic Bill of Rights in the Constitution. Uh, working people had to do it themselves, and they did. They went out on strike, and they faced the police and the National Guard and the Army, and, and they won. Uh, and the same thing was true of people in the South, black people in the South. They, knew, they learned very soon they could not depend on on the Constitution. Oh, sure, the 14th and 15th Amendments. No president enforced the 14th and 15th Amendments. Every president for almost 100 years violated his oath of office, which is to see that the laws are faithfully executed. And no president enforced, and up to Johnson and Kennedy, no, none of them enforced the 14th and 15th Amendments until black people went out into the streets uh, all over the South and created the kind of commotion and went to jail and some of them were killed and created the kind of commotion that aroused the nation and aroused the world and embarrassed the American government into finally passing some legislation so that the 14th and 15th Amendments could have some meaning. At those moments, democracy came alive. And that's what we need today. We need democracy to come alive today. And it's possible, and we, generally people feel powerless, but. Keep this in mind, the people in power only have, hold their power because of our obedience, really. When the obedience of the population disappears, the people in power uh, no longer have their power. Uh, corporations need workers to work. If the workers stop working, the corporation is helpless. If they declare a boycott of grapes, the, however powerful the farm growers are, they will give in if people stop buying grapes. Uh, when soldiers begin to rebel, as they did in Vietnam in the last few years of the anti-war movement, then the government has to take cognizance of that. Yeah, they depend on our obedience, and our job is to begin withholding our obedience and declaring that we ourselves are going to be the agents of democracy, that we ourselves are going to bring democracy al alive in this country. And, and you'll hear them say, people in power will say, well, no, we will never submit. We, we will, oh, we will never give in. We will never cut and run. Well, we will always do. No. 
You know, the, the history is littered with the confident statements of people in power that they will never give in, and they did. You know, I mean, dictators who seem to have absolute power wake up one morning and there's a million people in the capital and they're on a helicopter flying off somewhere. Uh, and in South Africa, they said, we will never end apartheid, but they ended apartheid. You know. George Wallace said uh, to meetings in the South, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. And a few years later, segregation was ended in Alabama. I remember a moment uh, uh, in 1965, and I joined the march from Selma to Montgomery uh, in the spring of 1965. On uh, the last night before the last leg of the march, the, the 20 miles to Montgomery, that last night we all were in our sleeping bags. It had rained, poured rain the night before, and, and our sleeping bags were resting in the mud of this field. And that's how we spent the night. And then the next day, we, we marched 20 miles to Montgomery. Uh, an amazing scene. We got to Montgomery. I decided I wasn't going to hang around for the speeches. Uh, I wanted to go home. Much of my revolutionary activity has been cut short by my wanting to go home. <laughs> So I made my way to the airport in Montgomery, and I was splattered with mud. <laughs> um, and there I, I met, ran into a man who had just arrived in Montgomery to, to be at the proceedings. This was Whitney Young, who was, had been my colleague and friend uh, in Atlanta, uh, tall, black, man, distinguished looking, and so we decided we'd have a cup of coffee together. Well, restaurants in Selma were still segregated. Uh, but we went into the cafeteria, as, and we sat down. This young woman came over to us and stopped. And I could see in her eyes this conflict. What is she going to do? And then she turned to Whitney, and she said, May I serve you, sir? And uh, then I looked at her apron, and she had a big button on it, which says, the Deep South says never. Uh, well, keep this in mind. All those statements uh, will shatter immediately as soon as people get together, as soon as people organize. And people don't have to do heroic things. All of us, very few of us can do heroic things but we can do little things. And at certain points in history, millions of those little things accumulate, come together, and you have a movement, and you have power, and something changes. Uh, so I want to close by reading a poem uh, written by Marge Piercy. Uh, it's from her book, The Moon is Always Female. What can they do to you, whatever they want? They can set you up, they can bust you, they can break your fingers, they can burn your brain with electricity, blur you with drugs till you can't walk, can't remember. They can take your child, wall up your lover. They can do anything. You can't stop them from doing. How can you stop them alone? You can fight, you can refuse, you can take what revenge you can, but they, they roll over you. Two people can keep each other sane can give support, conviction, love, massage, hope, sex. Three people are a delegation, a committee, a wedge. With four, you can play bridge and start an organization. <laughs> with six, you can rent a whole house, eat pie for dinner with no seconds, and hold a fundraising party. A dozen make a demonstration. A hundred fill, fill a hall. A thousand have solidarity in your own newsletter. 10,000 power in your own paper, 100,000 your own media, 10 million your own country. He goes on one at a time. It starts when you care.
to act. It starts when you do it again after they said no. It starts when they say, when you say we and know who you mean, and each day you mean one more. Thank you. Thank you. I was told we have a question period. Uh, uh, I was told the question period will go to 8.30. That gives you five minutes. Uh, it's a, a typical freedom of speech situation. Uh, but maybe we, can, maybe we can take more than that. Uh, are there two microphones or one? Oh, there are two. Yeah, I can't see too well, but... Uh, uh, the honor system uh, will alternate, okay? That mic first and then you. And, uh, and when somebody in authority gives me the signal, we'll quit. <laughs> okay? Good evening, Mr. Sin. I don't think I need to say how much I admire you. But I just want to ask you a question. I'm from Puerto Rico. And as you probably know, Nelson Miles, the same guy that exterminated a lot of Indians here in the United States, came to Puerto Rico in 1898 to bestow upon us the blessings of American institutions and to free us um, from our own miserable condition. And I guess that 108 years uh, later, Americans are still freeing us. But I don't know from what, because I don't feel free at all. We are a Latin American nation subjected to the power of a president and a Congress that we do not elect. And the president of the United States can send a Puerto Rican to die on an unjust war in Iraq. A poor Puerto Rican, by the way. Um, so I wanted to know, what do you think are the prospects for Puerto Rican decolonization? And do you think and I guess you do, that this is very relevant to the topic that we're discussing today, bringing democracy alive, allowing a nation to determine its own future and mm -hmm. being the owner of its own land. Well, uh, <laughs> you, you know what I think. <laughs> uh, and uh, you've said it so eloquently, and you know the situation there you know, better than I and better than most of us. Uh, and you, and question you ask is, do I, do I think something will change <laughs> in, uh, well, uh, we extrapolate from little victories to the future. And uh, the United States was using the island of Vieques, right? The island was using Puerto Rican island of Vieques uh, as a bombing target, as a b test site, and, and the, uh, and the people of Vieques uh, protested and protested. Year after year, yeah, they protested. And, uh, and finally, the protests grew so st strenuous and so threatening that the United States had to withdraw from Vieques. It's possible to, you know, uh, to win small victories and to uh, understand that once you can win small victories, you can win big ones. And so um, my hope is that the people of Puerto Rico will get what they want at some point. If they, if they have people like you <laughs> working, and uh, they'll make it, I'm sure. All right, Howard. Uh, I uh, had you in class in, uh, in 1972 
And so I'm very appreciative uh, to have a chance to actually be in class with you again tonight after so many years. And I can thank the committee, whoever put this together. It's just a wonderful, wonderful evening. I had a question for you about the origins of the Iraq War. You mentioned uh, that you thought you know, part of the motivation was for Halliburton and for uh, Bechtel and other big companies. Uh, I was curious uh, whether you thought uh, the Bush family's relationship with Saudi Arabia uh, has a relationship to why we're in Iraq. We were, after all, attacked on September 11 by jets that were manned not by Iraqis, but by 15 Saudis, 15 out of the 19 hijackers. And yet, instead of attacking Saudi Arabia or doing anything against Saudi Arabia, we attack Iraq. So I'm, I'd like you to comment about that, you know, whether you feel that uh, there's, there's some uh, connection with the Bush family for you know, protecting Saudi Arabia involved. And then secondly, I have a second question. I hate to ask two, but the second question is, if there is a connection, and if the Bush family is protecting Saudi Arabia, and favoring the interests of that country over the United States, where we were attacked on September 11, it seems to me that one of the grounds for impeachment should be treason. And I don't think it should be community service, the penalty paid for treason. And I wanted your comment on that, too. Uh, I'll answer the first question. <laughs> uh, the easy one. Uh, but uh, you ask, how come we have fixed on, well, remember, first Afghanistan and then Iraq? Uh, and why not Saudi Arabia? Well, the answer is simple. Saudi Arabia is our friend, our ally. They can do whatever they want. Our relationship with Saudi Arabia is sort of a deep friendship, a heartwarming friendship. <laughs> uh, it goes back to the end of World War II when uh, Franklin Roosevelt met uh, Ibn Saud uh, in 1945, and they made a deal. And the deal was that from now on, the United States is going to be the major player in the oil fields of Saudi Arabia and the Middle East. The English and the French and the Dutch were going to be eased out. And in return, the United States would maintain the power of the Saudi monarchy, no matter what they did to women, no matter what they did to their own people, no matter what they were like, no matter how many hijackers would come out of their country in the future, they are our friends. It's an old principle in American foreign policy. If, if there's a country which does what you want, you let it do what it wants, no matter what it does. And that's been our attitude towards Saudi Arabia. Hello. Thank you so much for this talk. It's so interesting and thought-provoking. Um, I wanted to know if you think there are any other countries that exercise their democracy better than the US, and if so, why? Uh, if there is any other country that what? That um, exercise their democracies better than the U.S. Oh, and if any so, other why? country that has democracy, exercise democracy better than the U.S.? It's interesting. This always comes up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, this is no, uh, no, no slight on you to say that you weren't the first one to ask this question, you know, but it's a question that comes up because when you criticize the United States, very often a, a question, and this may not be the, the intent of your question, very often there's a kind of uh, challenging question. Well, where would you rather live? <laughs> uh, why don't you go back to, uh, or, you know, well, actually I like living here. See, there's the Red Sox, and there's uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and, and there's a lot of good things. Uh, and, uh, and it's a beautiful country. It's a beautiful country. It's been taken over by a little gang, you see. Of it. But, it's, but uh, are there countries that are more democratic? Democracy, and this is what I tried to say, there's a spectrum, and it's very complicated. Uh, there are countries that that have more economic democracy than we do. There are. There are countries that have, there are countries that have free medical care for everybody. There are countries that take better care of their children and their old people than we do. 
Economic, the economic aspect of democracy is, is a very important one. And there are countries which in their foreign policy are not uh, as aggressive and bullying and violent as the United States. Uh, lots of them. I mean, there are lots of countries in the world that don't worry about terrorism the way we do. Uh, these are countries that don't bother anybody. <laughs> we bother other places in the world uh, very seriously. And uh, so, so, yes, there are, there's no country which is ideal. And I, it's not, I, you know, there's one, no one uh, a perfect place that I can say is a democracy. They all have their problems, but no. Uh, you know, we're more democratic than a lot of countries in the world. Uh, although there's no country in the world that is more aggressive in our foreign policy than us. But uh, it's, uh, you know, the question, you know, where countries uh, place on this complicated spectrum of democratic and less democratic, you know, is very complicated. You know, we, uh, you know, we're, we have, there are 25 countries in the world that have better uh, records uh, in child and in infant mortality than we do. There are 30 countries in the world that have better literacy rates than we do. You know, there are many, many countries, I mean, this is according to, you know, the international acute, uh, international organizations that, that study this. Uh, and uh, so, uh, all I'm saying is, uh, everybody in every country has the problem of making their country more democratic. And I think it's uh, probably a good idea to take a clear-eyed look at where we are and, uh, and not just measure us by the worst places in the world to say, well, you see, we're much better than they are, but to measure ourselves against the kind of country we should be. And it should be a country where people are taken care of a country without racism, and a country that is not militarized, and a country that doesn't spend its wealth on guns and bombs, and a country that, yes, it can be a superpower, but it should be not a military superpower, but a humanitarian superpower, you know, and uh, that's what we should be aiming for. Um, Howard, thank you. Hi, Jim. Um, you mentioned GIs refusing to go to Vietnam. And um, I just want to emphasize that nobody can make you go to Iraq uh, if, if you're, it takes courage and it's difficult, but um, you can refuse to go to Iraq even if you're in the military. And I want to bring up um, the example of Lieutenant Aaron Watada, who is the first commissioned officer to refuse deployment to Iraq and I bring it up in part to ask you to comment on his, I believe, very courageous act and very uh, profoundly moral uh, act of, of resistance, but also to invite everybody here to come on Sunday evening to hear his father, Bob Watada, and other, uh, well, some other well-known speakers and performers at an event to support him uh, at a church in Harvard Square, the First Parish Church, Sunday evening at 7 o'clock. And that event is organized by the Smedley Butler Brigade, a chapter of Massachusetts Veterans for Peace. Uh, Jim, I have a feeling it's, that's not a question, but an announcement, <laughs> about, which is a good announcement, and I'm, I'm with it. Thank you. Yes. Would you, Howard, would you, like, would you like to say anything at all by way of just slight elaboration from what you know about the case of uh, no. Lieutenant Watata? No, actually... There's no point in my elaborating. You know more about the case than I do. Uh, you know, I know, you know, I've heard about it, but I don't know a lot about it. And you've told us a little about it, and, you know, it's very clear what's right and wrong in this case. Anybody who refuses duty in this ugly war uh, should be supported and, and applauded. And we will need more acts of civil disobedience in this country if the war is going to come to an end. Yes. Professor, um, I know you've talked a lot about rebellion, but is it really possible to work for change within our own government? Is it possible what? To work for change within our own government. To work for change within, within our own government. Is it possible? 
barely. Uh, that is, uh, uh, it's possible, but not easy. That is, the tendency is, and, and, it, and it's, it's understandable. You think, well, you know, I, I want to get in there <laughs> where the power is and do what I can. But the, the, what happens most often with people who go into government hoping to change government policy is generally they get swallowed up in the bureaucracy and they find themselves surrounded and shouted down. And uh, uh, even if they get up high, even, I mean, even if they're up there in, in, at cabinet meetings and, and, well, you know, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. was there at cabinet meetings when they're discussing the, uh, the, the invasion of the Bay of Pigs, and he was opposed to it, but uh, what could he do? At least he didn't feel he could do anything. He was, uh, there were all these brass around him, and he felt intimidated. There are occasional rebellions of people inside the government, occasional heroic rebellions, very occasional. Daniel Ellsberg is, you know, who brought the Pentagon Papers to light. Uh, there's an example of somebody who was in, in the government and then did something remarkable in exposing the secrets of the government. Uh, but in general, if I had to give advice, and I very often was asked for this advice when, not when I was teaching, and young people come to me and say, well, I really want to change things. Should I go into the Foreign Service? No. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, or, uh, I really want to do something great. Should I go to law school? <laughs> Alex? <laughs> Alex McDonald can an answer that question better than I can. But uh, I would say, maybe. <laughs> uh, and uh, because we, you know, we've had most most people most most people go into law, yeah, <laughs> end up uh, submerged under uh, huge volumes of corporate law and insurance law and so on and so forth. But there there are a minority of lawyers who do wonderful things and on behalf of the poor and on behalf of people who have been charged with crimes and people who don't have any help. So anyway, I'll take uh, how many more questions? I think, uh, yeah, uh, two, one, one more from each mic, OK? Um, well, I go to school here. and. Um, like so many of your students in the 60s and 70s, and <clears throat> yourself as well, you know, I make the same commute, you know, in Commonwealth, day in and day out, class, you know, work, you know, sleep, all that. But unlike, unlike your students, it just seems to me that that passion just isn't there. I just, I see, I just see 44,000 people, like so many shades, just going in and out, day in and day out, you know self-absorbed and you know I completely you know put myself in this you know same malady of you know our generation right now and I don't know I guess what I'm trying to say is there's 44,000 of us that's you know if we each put down a dollar we could come up with another kid's tuition you know but 44,000 of us and how do how the hell do we get it together you know how do we you know Jesus Christ it's <laughs> enervating <laughs> Yeah, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I'm actually I, I didn't hear everything you said. So, I, <laughs> but my general answer to most questions is I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> Who, who are these 44,000 people you're talking about? Uh, all of us. Uh, huh? You know, the 44,000 of us mm -hmm. that, that go to this school, the 44,000 students that attend BU that, you oh, know. 44,000 at BU. Right. Oh, I see. I'm just saying, compare, compare oh. to the passion that seems to me that was there in the 60s mm. and 70s, and just that, that drive, that, you know, that just that unifying yeah. drive towards change, it's, yeah. I, just, I just feel a lack in that. And 
you know, we all feel the same way. It says, well, you know, we're, we all feel uh, very small and powerless, and we look at all the people around us who are not doing anything, just concentrating on their lives. But uh, that's how things happen. When you aren't discouraged by that, when you go on, when you keep on, at, and, uh, and you join whoever you can find, two people, five people, ten people, uh, and you persist. A social change doesn't come quickly, doesn't come easily. Uh, it requires a lot of patience, not the patience of passivity, but the patience of, uh, of persistence in whatever you do and a kind of faith that if you keep doing what you're doing and keep working and keep defying the orthodoxy of the society around you, uh, that more and more people will gather around. And, that, and there are people all over the country that you don't know about who feel the same way and, and who are organizing and are doing things. On, you know, we're, this is a very big country, and you very often have no idea what is happening in the rest of the country, but the fact is, and I, I travel a lot around the country, and wherever you go in this country, however, however small the town, there are always little clusters of people working for good things, for equal rights for women, for against racism, uh, for the environment. Uh, and uh, uh, it's, I'm encouraged by the existence of these people and by the knowledge that small movements become large movements uh, with patience and persistence. I was on campus here in the 80s, and uh, when I first got here, people told me you have to get into a Zen class. And uh, at the time, I had to be an upperclassman in order to get in because the draw was so high. And then by the time I got to be an upperclassman, you had to be, uh, you had to be in the right major. You had to be a grad student. So I've been waiting 20 years to actually supposed to be here to be listening to you because <laughs> I had to sneak into your lectures when I was actually an undergrad. Um, but uh, I guess I have a... a, a a question to ask and, and then a favor. And, and uh, the, given the, uh, the political climate, as you said, the, the different places that we've been and, and how we've tried to impose our foreign policy, uh, and at the time that, uh, as you mentioned, Castro, you know, making his own decision, um, given how unstable small aircraft seem to be with the leaders of countries that we don't happen to like at the time, uh, my favor is that should the opportunity ever arise that you were offered uh, the opportunity to be in a plane with Hugo Chavez, please don't. <laughs> I, I think that I think the uh, the temptation would be too much. Um, and, and the question I have is, uh, if we were to use the Constitution to perhaps a couple months down the road, uh, ultimately make Nancy Pelosi the first female president of the United States. Do we have to uh, impeach Cheney and Bush at the same time, or is there a particular order that we have to <laughs> do that in? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's wait <laughs> and see. and see what the, who's going to become Speaker of the House and what the order of succession will be, and then we, you and I can sit down and plan our strategy. <laughs> I'm Alex's wife, BU School of Medicine 76, but to, for Alex to let me get up here is a big uh, challenge. <laughs> um, Howard, uh, you had my heart stir in the last few minutes of your speech. It was really stirred. I felt like a blessed American again when I heard the hope about bringing democracy alive. And um, I could be accused of nostalgia because to hear those stories again about the civil rights movement, for example, um, made me go back to the individuals involved here because we're honoring an individual. And there's so many young students here, including my two daughters and their college friends, that um, it is the power of our meeting one-on-one -on -one 
that I think inevitably will give us hope. And uh, it was because my husband met you um, that it sounds, it's not just a pat Hollywood movie ending, uh, Mr. Holland's opus. Um, it is inspiring that you met Alex and you met so many untold students. So if each one of those 44,000 students wants to give up a Starbucks, um, we could pay for two <laughs> students to be leaders and to perhaps meet someone else. So the power of what you stirred my heart at the end is exactly what you did here every day and touched my husband and what a dream come true for him and for me. And uh, take those dreams and carry them out into the world. There is still hope. Thank you, Howard.